Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are, because I know we're all in different time zones. Um, so any greeting is appropriate, probably. Um, on behalf of my convener, Professor Anna Ever, and my own, I would like to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture in the EAS Invited Lecture Series in Bilingualism and Multilingualism. The series is organized jointly by the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Studies and Humanities of Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, by the Faculty of English at the same university, and by the Poznań branch of Bilingualism Matters. And together with my colleague, Professor Evert, we have planned this series of open lectures by outstanding researcher, researchers, distinguished scholars, and world experts in the field of bilingualism and multilingualism. The series will consist of eight lectures that are um, each given delivered by a different invited speakers, and they'll be held starting of today and um, over the next eight or nine months. And the lectures will be delivered via the Zoom platform and will be stream, uh, live streamed on Facebook of the Faculty of English. Additionally, each lecture will be followed by a seminar type meeting with graduate students and PhD students from Adam Mickiewicz University, at which meeting uh, the students will be given an opportunity to discuss various aspects of their own research with the invited experts. And today it is our great honor and privilege to welcome Professor Ellen Bialystok, who will deliver the opening lecture on how bilingualism changes minds in our series. We would like to welcome everybody with a keen interest in bilingualism and multilingualism, and we're extremely happy to be able to host over uh, 500 or uh, uh, we had 700 registrations, right? Participants registered. I, I can see that you're all joining in right now still on Zoom, on the Zoom meeting and numerous others are following us via the live stream on Facebook. And we, I would like to extend very special warm welcome to our very special guests for um, guest participants in today's lecture the Vice Rector for International Cooperation at Adam Mickiewicz University, Professor Rafał Wikowski, mm -hmm. and the Dean of the Faculty of English, Professor Joanna Pawelczyk. Mm -hmm. And may I kindly ask you, Vice Rector and Madame Dean, to take the floor and join us in welcoming Professor Bialystok and all the um, participants to today's inaugural lecture. Yes. Mr. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to today's lecture by a distinguished expert, Professor Ellen Bialystok. As you may know, Adam Mickiewicz University belongs to the European University Initiative Epicure, an important element of which is research and teaching on multilingualism. A pillar of our university's involvement is the activity of the English School of Adam Mickiewicz University. The invited lecture series in bilingualism and multilingualism is one of the most fruitful and clear manifestations of the academic prestige of the Poznan School of English. I am very proud and very grateful that the lecture series will be initiated by Professor Ellen Bialystok. And in fact, the entire Epicor University Alliance can benefit from this outstanding event. Therefore, I am sending to Professor Bialystok warm greetings from Poznan, and I'm extremely grateful for accepting our invitations. Thanks so much. Thank uh, thanks so much, Vice Rector. Thank you very much. And may I ask now the Dean of the Faculty of English? welcome us as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much and I'm going to stick to a good evening. Uh, so a good evening to everyone once again. It's really a great pleasure to be here and I want to extend a very warm um, virtual welcome from Poznan and the Faculty of English uh, at Adam Miskevich University. And um, we're extremely happy to launch today this new series of lectures on bilingualism and multilingualism 
And as we heard, it is funded by the newly established Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences and Humanities as part of the Excellence Initiative Research University project that is recently carried out at our university. And as we also heard, um, the series is organized by the Faculty of English and uh, Bilingualism Matters at Poznan. So we are more than delighted and honored to have as our inaugural speaker, Professor Alan Bialystok. It's a great pleasure and we, um, we already sent an invitation for uh, Professor Bialystok to visit us physically in Poznan. Uh, and uh, uh, we're extremely happy and it's a true honor. So thanks so much for uh, accepting our invitation. I wish you a very inspirational evening and please enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Thanks so much, Madame D. Thank you very much. And I would like now to invite Professor Anna Evert, um, uh, our co my co-convener, to present our distinguished speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Professor Ellen Bialystok is actually a person you do not need to introduce because uh, to everybody who works in the field of bilingualism, she is the person or the name that everybody should be familiar with. Professor Ellen Bialystok is a distinguished research professor of psychology and Walter Gordon Research Chair for, uh, of Lifespan Cognitive Development at York University. She's also Associate Scientist at the Rotman Research Institute of the Baycrest Center for Geriatric Care. Today's lecture by Professor Bialystok is on how bilingualism changes minds. And as the hundreds of attendees who registered for our meeting today, uh, um, knew who, whose lecture to attend this evening, uh, Professor Bialystok has been working for a very long time now on how bilingualism changes minds. First, it was the minds of children, um, later adults and the elderly. So welcome, Professor Bialystok. It's over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me and for the honor of being the first speaker in this really wonderful series. So I'm grateful for all of that. And I, um, I look forward to speaking with all of you after my talk. I'm going to give an overview of some of the things that I've been thinking about and try to look at some of the ways that this experience that we're all familiar with may be much bigger than we have considered. So if I may share my screen. The point about bilingualism is that it's one of the experiences that contributes to what's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, all that means is your brain adapts to the things that you make it do. It changes. You engage in activities and those activities change your brain. So why would bilingualism, why would the very common experience of using two languages actually change your brain? And the reason comes down to a very, um, uh, counterintuitive fact, and I don't use the word fact lightly uh, as a social scientist, but it is supported by so much research. The, in the mind of a bilingual, all of the usable languages are jointly activated, and this leads to conflict. That means that there's a constant need in a bilingual mind for selection. We know that bilinguals don't make a lot of mistakes. They don't normally slip into the wrong language. So if there is joint activation of both languages, and we know there is, there must be a very good mechanism for selecting the one you need. And the proposals around that question 
have focused on domain general processes for selection in the front part of the brain that are used for all selection, no matter what. You go into the supermarket and there's you know, 10 different kinds of cereal boxes. How do you focus on the one you want? These are all problems that are handled by selection processes in the front of the brain. So the idea then is that these selection processes, which are part of the attention network, are used all the time just for keeping bilinguals in the right language, and they are therefore modified. So the neuroplasticity piece is that bilingualism requires using a part of your brain that's typically used for something else in order to keep the languages straight. The consequence is that this need for language selection modifies that general attention system. Now, as I said, this is a counterintuitive idea. I know if I were going to build a brain that could handle two languages, I'd put in a switch. I'd make a little toggle so you speak in this language and then that language and so on. So you have this extra problem of toggling the switch, but there's no conflict. But that's not how it is. There is instead joint activation. So a constant flow of attention is required to select the right language. And this situation is what Judith Kroll has called mental juggling. And it's that mental juggling that is the basis of bilingual adaptations to the brain. So these language selection processes are, are based on the same uh, brain regions and processes used in nonverbal selection. And crucially, selection is a part of what we call the executive function system or executive control. More on that soon. Now there's been a lot of research looking at the cognitive and brain uh, consequences of bilingualism. This slide is a kind of a map of all that research. And what you can see, the research extends across the lifespan. And above the dotted line, I've put research that's behavioral and below it research that includes neuroimaging. What I've inserted in these cells is various kinds of research paradigms. So these aren't specific studies, but these are categories of studies. In some cases, um, an entry represents 30 or 40 studies that are all of that type, sometimes even more. And in some cases, just two or three. So the, there's maybe three studies or four studies of visual language recognition in infancy. But I've, in, I've included them here to give you a sense of the breadth of the research. Now, across all of this research, and this is a huge body of research at this point, there are certain patterns that emerge. Now, if you're gonna do 100 studies, you're not gonna get the same result 100 times. There will be cases where you get different results, cases where you get no results, this will happen. But the pattern that emerges across all of these studies, typically, is that on a variety of tasks that involve attention, executive control, um, uh, executive functioning in some way, bilinguals perform better than monolinguals. That's the pattern, except for here. And this is the source of controversy. This is what everybody wants to talk about. It turns out that for young adults performing behavioral tasks that we call executive function tasks, there's very often no difference between groups. I want to look at that. Here's a study we did in 2005, long before there was anything that people now call a controversy. So 2005, we took a very simple executive function task, assignment task, 
The rule is if you see a red square, press the button on the left. If you see a green square, press the button on the right. But these squares can be on either side. So you get congruent and incongruent trials because in half the cases, there's conflict between the button you need to press and the position it appears on the screen. And this is a well-known conflict task. So it's a very simple task. And we gave it to groups of monolingual and bilingual participants who were different ages. So we gave it to children. Now in all of the slides that I'm going to show you, monolinguals are in red and bilinguals are in blue. So just kind of learn that rule and you won't have to squint at the legend. These are reaction times, so higher lines mean slower response. These are children responding to congruent and incongruent trials. Monolinguals are slower. These are middle-aged adults responding to those trials. Monolinguals are slower. Notice the bilinguals aren't even bothered by the incongruent trials in this age group. Older adults, monolinguals and bilinguals. And we gave it to young adults. And here are the results. They are really fast. And in fact, their RT on average is about 500 milliseconds. This is very fast. It's a really easy task. So what we published, what we reported in 2005 is that in three age groups, bilinguals perform this task faster and more efficiently than monolinguals. And these results have been replicated many times and there's many meta-analyses and so forth. And the null results too have been replicated. But there was a bit of a fuss about it made a few years later when Ken Pat published a paper and said, the results don't replicate. They don't replicate. And they published a paper in 2013 saying they followed all of our procedures and the results did not replicate their study only included young adults, and to this day only includes young adults. So let's see what their results look like, but don't replicate. I'm going to put their results directly onto my same graph. Okay, there they are. I'll show you again. Those are our results. Those are their results. And it's on this basis they say our studies don't replicate. They replicate exactly. But it's not that simple. It's not as simple as taking monolingual and bilingual young adults, assigning them by some basis into these groups and giving them a very easy reaction time task. We know that the groups are gonna perform the same and specifically they will take 500 milliseconds to respond. So what's going on? How do we explain the effect of bilingualism on cognition? I'm gonna go through the logic here. And remember I said I was going to come back to this idea of executive function or executive control. So, and I'm also talking about how we had to explain this 20 years ago. So the assumption was, and I've shown you this, that language selection engages those executive function processes that are used for domain general selection and are therefore enhanced. How do we explain this in terms of executive control? Well, 20 years ago, there was a new model proposed that was really the only show in town, the only way of uh, trying to understand how executive function might work. And this is the unity and diversity model proposed by Miyake and colleagues. And it was an exciting new model, made a lot of sense, and it framed a lot of the research. So myself and other people doing this uh, adopted it as a way of trying to understand what we, were what we were seeing. We were saying bilinguals use executive function for language selection, here's what executive function looks like. Let's see how helpful this is. So here's the Miyake model. They gave nine different executive function tasks to a bunch of people, young adults. 
they um, assigned these tasks, it was confirmatory factor analysis. So they already had an idea of where they would cluster. Um, their performance on the nine tasks was evaluated in terms of these three components of executive functioning, which they called updating, shifting, and inhibition. And on that basis, um, they presented their model. So the model is that this is the structure of executive function within each component. There's tremendous overlap. Um, there's some overlap across components, but much less so. Now to apply it to bilingualism, the argument goes like this. You take one of the tasks, for example, Stroop task, and do an experiment and find that the bilinguals uh, perform this task better. And we have such data. They do perform the Stroop task better. So I'm using here the term better bilingual performance, because that's all you can say. So you can say, all right, on the Stroop task, there was better bilingual performance. But according to Miyake, Stroop is an indication of inhibition. That's where it is. Therefore, bilinguals have better inhibition because that's what the Stroop task measures. And therefore, Bilinguals should be better on all tasks that are clustered as inhibition, um, as inhibition tasks. That's the logic. But it didn't work. And over a period of about 10 years, it increasingly became clear that whatever was predictive about results for bilinguals didn't fit with this model. For example, the idea of the um, integrity and the uh, unity of these different components, it was never supported. There, was, there weren't correlations where there should have been. Um, absence of correlations, the model says that inhibition, for example, is the key to the tasks in the inhibition section. All of the tasks in inhibition have what are called congruent and, and incongruent trials, but they only need inhibition on the incongruent trials. There's, there's no, on the example I showed you with the Simon task, if the response key was on the same side as the stimulus, you don't have to inhibit anything. And yet a bunch of research, and here's some studies showed, these are just studies from our lab with children, young adults, adolescents, and older adults. The results for congruent and incongruent trials were always exactly the same. It could not be that it was inhibition of what was going on with the incongruent trials because we got identical results with congruent trials, it didn't fit. Um, there also turned out to be a big problem with what is meant by inhibition. There's two kinds of inhibition, and they're completely different. One kind has to do with inhibiting an actual response, like in a go-no-go no go task. And the other is inhibiting interference from a perceptual stimulus, like in a flanker or stroop task. And what we found, and these are all inhibition, they're in the same module. However, bilinguals routinely outperform monolinguals on um, interference suppression, never on response inhibition. So that didn't work. And then again, about half the time, there was just no effect. So if bilinguals have better inhibition, why do half of the studies show no difference? These are big problems. So either the predictions are wrong and bilingualism has no effect on cognition or the model is wrong. And why would the model be wrong? Well, it took a long time to figure it out, but there's the, the thing about the model is that it's reductionist. The model reduces all of the complexity of bilingualism, 
cognitive interactions to two categorical oversimplifications, which are now dominant in the literature, but they are oversimplifications. The first is, it leads to the interpretation that if bilinguals are performing better than monolinguals on some of these tasks, in some of these components, then there must be a thing, and I emphasize thing, called a bilingual advantage, or even worse, the bilingual advantage. What does that even mean? We're talking about complex brain behavior relations. What would it mean to reduce all this to a thing called the bilingual advantage? And furthermore, the model invites the interpretation that the basis of that thing is inhibition. None of that fits with what we know from the evidence. So let's go back to the model. All of the research has shown that these categories of components and the relation between the tasks within components don't follow the logic and predictions necessary from this structuralist model. So let's get rid of the components and return to the level of tasks. This is just the, um, the empirical evidence on which um, models should be built. These are the tasks we give to participants. So if we look across those tasks, what occurs is that they all require attention, every one of them. Attention is in the front part of the brain, that's clear. The front part of the brain is involved in executive control, that's clear too. But what does it tell us about what bilingualism is doing? Well, let's throw away those components and say more broadly, Bilingualism in some ways modulating attention. In some sense, it's modulating the, the way the attention networks are set up in the brain. It's a different kind of story from the components. So is there any evidence? Is there any evidence that tasks that are just attention tasks and cannot be classified in that structuralist componential model um, are impacted by bilingualism. And I'm going to give you two or three quick examples. The first one from infants. So attention, this is key to EF. Um, and we're looking at infants. Infants, they don't say anything. They don't speak, they don't switch languages but they are immersed in language soup. And some of them are immersed in two soups. So the idea here is that the linguistic environment for infants in bilingual homes is more complex. And we know from fantastic research by people who do infancy research, uh, for, for whom I have immense respect, this is, well, I've only ever done this one infancy study. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. But there's tremendous uh, evidence in this literature showing that from six months old, bilingual infants, infants in bilingual environments, keep the languages separate. They know when the languages switch. They can tell when somebody is switching from one language to the next, even without any sound. They are building up two representational systems, and they're not confused. So they're living in a more complex environment. They're building up a more complex representational, representational space than infants in a monolingual environment. So can we find anything in attention? This is a study we did with six month old infants. They, they're put in this very nice comfy little um, crib really in a darkened room. They look at this monitor, their eyes, uh, we have an eye tracker there and we start showing them stuff. So the task works like this. In the first part, they see either a checkerboard or a, or a target and they learn that if you see a checkerboard, this amazing dancing star, is gonna show up on the left side of the screen. 
And if they see um, a target, this, they love this dancing star. It's astounding what infants love. It's gonna show up on the right. And they really wanna see that star. So these trials go on and they learn the association. And again, remember monolingual and bilingual infants. This is a graph showing the percentage of trials for which they look to the correct place before the dancing star even appeared. There's no difference between groups. Uh, the dotted line is chance. They're way better than chance. They learn it. And this is how long it takes them to make that anticipatory eye movement. They are exactly the same. So amazingly, six-month-old infants learn this and they know which way um, is signaled to get that reward. So then part two of the experiment, we switch it all up. And so now each cue is gonna signal the opposite side. Can they learn the new rule? Can they switch their attention? Can they adjust their response? Can they change their responding? Well, the bilinguals could. You can see they're all, they're all much closer to chance. The monolinguals have dropped to chance. They don't know where to look. The bilinguals are now reliably looking in the right place. How long does it take them? The bilinguals, just like before, as soon as they figure it out, they figure it out. But the monolinguals now, they spend a lot of time looking around because they're confused. So what we see here is that at six months old, the bilingual infants could learn a new association and control attention, override the habit that had been built up. Uh, here's a quick one for children. I think in the in interest of time, I'm gonna skip this one and go straight to this, uh, this example with adults. Now, again, I want to contrast the kinds of results we expect from a competential view of executive function and from one that's based on attention as a continuous process. If we take any of those tasks that are used in this kind of research, you could see that the tasks all have different kinds of demands from each other. They're not all equivalent but you can also manipulate the demands within a task. In the componential model, the task is the unit. It is placed under a component and it has predictions around it. But what if we just take one task, hold the paradigm constant and manipulate instead the attention demands within that same task. So now we're not manipulating the components we're only changing the attention demand within a single task. Now, if the attention view is right, then manipulating the attention demands will change performance, will change the relation between monolingual and bilingual performance. But if the component model is right, this will have no effect because the task lives in a component, okay? So what we used here uh, was an NBAC task. It's a standard working memory task. It's used a lot in this research. And it has this particular ability to make it easier or harder. We used zero, one, two, and three back conditions. In a zero back task, it goes like this. You're gonna see a series of stimuli and um, every time you see a hand, every time a stimulus is a hand, you press the target button. If it's not a hand, you press the non-target button. So you're always responding, but you only say target if it's a hand. And it's zero back because it's right in front of you. In the next condition, one back, a target is a stimulus that you just saw in the previous trial. So here, P is a target because it matches the previous trial. Similarly, two back and three back. So the task is the same, but it gets harder and harder because you need more attention. You need to hold more of this in working memory. You need to be more vigilant, more attentive, but the task is the same. 
So we had four conditions. Uh, we counterbalanced the stimulus set so they appeared equally often, blah, blah, blah. And we uh, recorded EEG while participants performed the task. All right, what did we find? So we have monolingual and bilingual young adults performing the same task that's getting harder and harder in a very specific way. It's getting harder because you need more attention. So here's the accuracy. Uh, zero, one, two, and three back. Um, no difference on the easiest conditions and they start to diverge. And as they diverge, you see that it's the monolinguals that are uh, finding it increasingly difficult. By the end, the difference is significant. The bilinguals are performing significantly better. However, no difference at all in reaction time. So given the same amount of time to respond, the bilinguals are more accurate as it gets harder. Now we have a lot of EEG data, but I'm going to show you one graph for the P300 because P300 measures attention. It measures the effortfulness of attention. And essentially it's a positive um, waveform. And the easier something is, the higher the amplitude, it's just a nice smooth run as you, you know, go through something that's, that's easy. But as the demands increase, attention gets involved, the amplitude decreases. So the smaller the amplitude, the more effortful the, um, the problem, the performance. All right, so here's, I blocked off the section that shows P300. And there's two things to notice. Uh, first, the blue lines are always higher than the red line. So it's always easier, always easier for the monoling, for the bilinguals, okay? Now on the zero back, that's the solid lines. You, you get a big difference. One back, notice that the, there's no difference between zero back and one back for bilinguals, but there is for monolinguals, two back and three back. So as the problem gets harder, the amplitude decreases as it should, but importantly, the biggest gap is for the hardest condition. What I've put here in, within the arrows is the gap for the three back. So remember, reaction time is the same. The bilinguals are a little more accurate, but the monolinguals are working way harder. This is much more effortful. So, even on a task that's fairly straightforward, they are using different mental resources to achieve that performance, and it's just easier for the bilinguals. The manipulation here is in attention. It's all the same paradigm. It's all a working memory or, or what uh, Miyaki would call updating task. All right. So, why is this so controversial? This is the elephant on the table, but let's talk about the elephant. I've shown you some data. All those data have been replicated, and yet there is a big argument that none of this can be believed. Why is that? So there are many positive effects of bilingualism, the pattern is not consistent with the componential model. And that makes it easy to dismiss. If you take that as the sort of standard for evaluating the results, the results don't fit. But there are a lot of positive results. And there are also, as I've said all along, a lot of null results. How do we know which is true? Do we believe the positive results or do we believe the null results? So I've listed some reasons you might consider rejecting the positive results and believing the null results. And I've just picked three. One thing you hear a lot is the research is confounded um, in that bilingualism is confounded with other things and SES, socioeconomic status, comes up a lot, but there's other suggestions. 
And so what you're seeing is not actually effects of bilingualism. You're seeing effects of SES. And so we can reject the positive results because they're not bilingual effects. All right, let's look at that. Because that's such a common argument, there's now a lot of research that pits SES against bilingualism. I'm just gonna show you two, two examples. First, it's really important to say SES is the most important predictor of EF that exists and certainly for children's development. In fact, SES is the most important predictor of all of children's development of any variety. So it matters. But is it confounded with bilingualism in this research? I'm going to show you two examples. This is a study um, that was done on a database uh, based on over 18,000 children who stretched across a huge range of SES and completed a number of executive function tasks. Here are the results, is Hartanto and, and colleagues. So across the x-axis, we have SES, very, very low SES, very high SES. And on the y-axis is the executive function score. Two things to notice, the blue line is always higher than the red line. There is an effect of SES, but notice the gap changes. There's an interaction effect. And the benefit of bilingualism is far more pronounced, far more important in the low SES group. That is children who are at risk, children who are struggling to develop these really important skills. If they're bilingual, they have some kind of, uh, of foot up in this process. So what's the, what these data show is that bilingualism boosts EF at every single level of SCS, but especially for kids at risk. It's not confounded. There's two factors. Another study uh, looked at the relation between SES and brain volume. Again, this is a huge thing. SES reduces children's brain volume and that's devastating for development. This is a study of just over of almost 600 children. So these are not plotted as a continuous SES. They're, class, they're categorized into SES groups. Uh, this is Natalie Brito and, uh, and Noble. And this is cortical brain volume. And obviously I don't have to tell you bigger is better. You want a big brain. So for the higher SES groups, there was no difference between the monolingual and bilingual children. But in the lower SES groups, look at this. So this is what we expect to see, really reduced cortical volume in lower SES kids. But for those lower SES, SES kids who were bilingual, they had much better brains. It was building their brains, okay? So again, what we see is that there are two factors. They're not confounded. All right, the second argument, uh, people have said, well, it's publication bias, only positive studies get published. I only wish that were true. It's nowhere near true. Uh, now studies are published all the time, but it also raises another point. And that is that the, why do we care about publication bias? Well, there may be a publication bias towards positive results, but what publication bias tells you is something about the ratio of positive to negative results that are published. It tells you nothing about the validity of the positive results. It's a different point. Furthermore, people will argue, yeah, those positive results, they're just type one error. That is a positive outcome that happens by chance. Type one error is a thing. Positive outcomes happen by chance. But for type one error to be an explanation, Statistically, there would need to be as many cases of monolinguals through type one error outperforming bilinguals 
as the opposite, but we never see that. There are essentially no studies of monolinguals outperforming bilinguals on these tasks. It's not type one error. And finally, some have argued that, yeah, you know, it's sample size. These are just little studies with a handful of subjects. They're not, and I've just shown you two very large ones. All right, but let's say we're on the other side. Why would we want to say we don't believe the null result? We want to believe the positive results and reject the null results. And here, the first reason is because of how bilingualism is defined. In essentially all the studies showing null results, possibly all of them, bilingualism is defined as a categorical variable that produces two groups. But bilingualism is not a categorical variable. It's a complex continuum. And along the continuum is a variety of experiences that vary qualitatively and quantitatively. More recently, researchers have taken the whole continuum as the independent variable instead of these discrete groups and looked for a relation between a degree of bilingualism and an outcome. And I'll just put up a few graphs. These, I don't want to spend time talking about them, but these are all continuous variables that show degree of bilingualism always along the x-axis is related to degree of outcome. They're continuous relations, not categorical relations. Type of task I've shown you already, it isn't the type of task, it's the processing demands of the task. And here's a big factor that I'm not going to elaborate on, but it's really important. And this is another new direction. One of the things that we need to pay much more attention to is the context of bilingualism. The context not only in which individuals use their language, but the social context that receives them. These are complex relations. And the most sophisticated um, description that's now generating a lot of wonderful research for this issue is the adaptive control model um, that David Green and Jubin Abudalebi have been proposing. This too needs to be brought into the complexity. So why do we care? Why do we care about executive function? Do we really care if somebody can perform a Stroop task 100 milliseconds faster than somebody else? And I have to say very clearly, we do not, because that's not what it's about. It's not about how fast you perform these tasks. But these tasks are a lens to the structure of an incredibly important part of the brain, the frontal cortex and the executive function system, which is central to all cognitive functioning. It's crucially important in child development. Children who develop better executive functioning go on to have better academic achievement, better long-term well-being. Think the marshmallow test if you know what I mean. Kids who pass the marshmallow test when they were three go on and have better lives. It's a remarkably important foundation for everything. And really another way of thinking about it, and I put this in red because I'm gonna come back to it. It's associated with something that we can call mental resilience, building a better brain, a more resilient brain a machine that's more efficient, that works more smoothly. So again, we don't care if you can perform a Stroop task 200 milliseconds faster. We care what that means about the resilience in your brain. And why do we care about that? Because it really pays off in older age where everybody's cognition slows down and declines. This is an inevitable part of aging. 
And we know that there is absolutely no effective treatment uh, once cognitive decline becomes a clinical condition. But we also know that lifestyle factors that lead to cognitive reserve have a significant um, impact on improving cognitive function. So I've been uh, writing recently about the evidence, um, which I'm not gonna talk about here, showing how, where this pays off later, where this pays off is later in the way in which lifelong bilingualism builds cognitive reserve. And I'm gonna argue it's not because older bilingual adults do, uh, can do a strip task faster, it's because they have more mental resilience. I'm only gonna show you one slide. This is a collection of studies done in different places, different countries all over the world, showing the mean age of diagnosis of clinical dementia for monolinguals and bilinguals. And these are ages, so higher bars mean that they're older. And you can see that across the board, the pattern is clear. Bilinguals are older when clinical symptoms become evident. And what we know from other research on this problem is that they also have more neuropathology, which means they've just coped longer. So the disease builds up, there's no symptoms until there is, but they're older and it's later. All right, so what's the mechanism? How does all this happen? Now, if you're going with the componential model, the mechanism is transfer. And the idea is that you build up inhibition and you're better at inhibition. So it transfers from uh, across these tasks within inhibition. So you do things in one domain and they transfer. You have a skill in one context and it is applied to a skill in the other context. For example, you learn how to inhibit a language and that makes you better at inhibiting an irrelevant feature in some other task. But that's not what happens. The alternative to transfer is adaptation. In adaptation, you have two skills. And both of these skills rest on some common underlying process. And that process is responsible for performance of both skills. So let's say the process is selective attention, and it's used both to select languages and for nonverbal selection. What neuroplasticity means in the sense of adaptation is that if you put that process in an environment that targets that process, adapts that process to a different set of demands, then that process is now fortified and available for everything it feeds into. Nothing has transferred. What you've changed is the network structure of the attention system. So neuroplasticity in this sense is the experience dependent adaptation of these processes, making them available across functions. And what bilingualism does, why bilingualism is a factor in neuroplasticity is because it requires an adaptation of the attention system. So let's go back to this map of the research. And what I'm going to suggest is that there's at least three kinds of evidence here that can be explained by changes in attention, but cannot be explained by a componential model of executive functioning. Or what I put on the slide, they cannot be explained by transfer. The infants are not transferring anything. The older adults who show symptoms of dementia later are not transferring anything. 
they're showing a more a resilience based on um, their um, ability with these attention functions. So does bilingualism affect cognitive and brain structures? Absolutely. Um, but we've been looking in the wrong place. It isn't where we thought it was going to be. It isn't, bilingualism doesn't make you better at inhibition. It was a simple and attractive, but wrong description. What bilingualism actually does is reconfigure attention networks in the brain. So it leads to adaptations in brain and behavior. Now, neuroplasticity is the thing. These are all experiences that have been acknowledged to lead to neuroplasticity. And I might say with some resentment, nobody ever complains about those, but I am proposing that in addition to all of those experiences, so does bilingualism. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for this fascinating talk. Thanks so much, Professor Bialystok. Um, we have uh, already quite a number of questions in the chat. So I invite everybody from the audience to ask the question. So together with Professor um, Anna Evert, we'll be reading the questions to you, that's okay. And uh, could I kindly ask you to address them? So the first question in the chat, is does musical ability affect bilingualism as well as multilingualism in the sense of recognizing cognitive speech patterns and syntax? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sure, absolutely. Um, you can also see if you'd like to follow okay, that in the it. chat, it might okay, be also me... easier. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Okay. That's the first question, but uh, I will read it out anyway. It's from Antoni Matteo Garcia. Does musical ability uh, affect okay. bilingualism as well as multilingualism in the sense of recognizing cognitive speech patterns? And so okay, on. right, great question. I like this because um, I'm, I'm not saying bilingualism is the only thing that has these kinds of effects. And you know, all of those little cartoon pictures on the last slide are examples. Now, music ability is interesting because people like to say, well, music is a language, so it's the same and the effects should be the same. And it isn't like that. So musical ability, musical um, uh, performance, musical experience also has neuroplastic effects on important brain functions. And some of them are similar to the effects of bilingualism, but they're not identical. So it has its own domains of, of impact that um, have some commonality, but are not the same. Okay, and the second question is also from Antoni Matteo Garcia. Uh, bilingual, bilingualism and multilingualism, additionally a question of nature versus nurture in terms of how children grow. You mean in terms of whether children can become bilingual? Is that the question? Can you clarify? Do you mean, is it an issue of nature that some children are more likely to become bilingual? Because I, I just want to be clear. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, the author of the question is uh, muted. Oh. So I guess the-, the, the, the yeah, I don't know what it's asking. Is it saying, um, is there I'm a muting Anthony at the moment. Okay. Well, it's basically um, a question of the environment that the children is ra are raised in, such as um, if their parents speak two or more languages, or whether they grow up in the environment they're in, or it could be a question of whether they have um, taken in those languages at a very young age and they have to survive with it as okay. they grow. Okay, okay. So there's a couple of points I, I would make here. Um, first, uh, nature and nurture impact everything. I mean, that's just a given, you know. Uh, there, 
people are better at things. Some people are more verbal and they learn languages more easily. Anybody who's had children will notice no two of them are the same um, in every single domain. So nature and nurture is always a factor in the ease and success of developing any skill. You know, everybody wants their children to take piano lessons and only some small number of them persist. And yet everybody learns language because it's not optional. So I'm gonna say that's background noise. Um, nature and nurture are always going to be there. But you're also raising two other, I, I wanna comment on two other implications of your question. One is, does it matter when they learn the other language and how, <clears throat> how much they heard it and on and on? Absolutely it does. And the research that I've been taught, I talked about now that's using bilingualism as a continuum takes those points very seriously. Exactly how old was the child? In what context? With what frequency of use and so on? So those details, uh, which you might call the nurture side of this, matter a great deal on the outcomes. But the other point I want to make is that I'm often asked, and maybe it'll come up in the chat, if so, I'm going to answer it now anyway. Um, the question is, uh, if two languages are so good, are three languages better? And that's a very troubling question. Because when you, well, when you well, when we're comparing monolinguals and bilinguals, I can be pretty sure that for the most part, not in every case, but for the most part, the bilinguals were not bilinguals by choice, they're bilinguals by circumstance. And so they learned two languages because that's what their family spoke, they didn't choose it. And so on all of the relevant variables, going back to your point about nature, these people are, are similar. They're, they're all just as smart as each other. They're all just as verbal as each other. It's just that circumstances have led one group to learn two languages. I'm not confident that that similarity extends to more languages because beyond two languages, you often, not always, but often have choice. Someone who's very interested in languages or talented for languages or smarter or richer or travels more, you're starting to introduce other factors that might also impact these outcomes. And since, as you saw, I'm very worried about confounding variables, I think it's simpler just to stick to monolinguals and bilinguals. So I don't know the answer for more languages, but I think it's a harder question to investigate. Thank you. Thanks so much. Indeed, this question will come up. <laughs> this is true. So if I may, the second uh, the third question, does the amount of code switching or immersion, degree of exposure to an L2, impact the relation between bilingualism and neuroplasticity? Can it yeah, influence? I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to say uh, overall, yes. And there are other people who investigate that. So I'm not going to try to um, describe that research. But in general, yes, it all matters. Thank you. Okay. Then we have a methodological question: How to decide a six months in six months old infant is is bilingual? Well, the infant is completely pre-verbal. They're six months old. They Google and drew drool and stuff. They don't say anything. So all we mean is that they're in a home where they hear either one language or they're in a home where they hear two languages. They don't say anything. They're they're just infants. Thank you. Can bilingualism change mind through cultural aspects? What do you mean? Hey, um, culture, oh, culture, oh, culture, I'm cultural sorry. Cultural uh, It's a great question. I don't know. I like the question. Um, you know, languages uh, represent cultures, some cultures bring a whole bunch of other stuff. I think it's entirely plausible. Um, I don't have any research to point to, but no reason it wouldn't be a, another factor. 
it's an interesting idea. I think it's it's worth some study. Okay, and another um, fairly simple question. If CES is the most important factor with respect to, to executive function, what about other factors such as age of acquisition and input? Uh, for, you mean, well, age of acquisition of the language, I, I assume, right? Because SES determines children's development of executive functioning. Age of acquisition determines the child's bilingual proficiency. So is the question, does that also determine the bilingual child's executive function development? I suppose, is, is that the logic? Um, so, so sure, I mean, what we know is that the more bilingual someone is, um, the greater these effects are. And that's what you saw in those graphs I showed you where there are all these linear correlations. So the more, the better. We know that age of acquisition is one important factor in that kind of dimensional continuous view of bilingualism. So earlier is better, but I'd be really, well, I just want to caution against, again, oversimplifying. So to say that age of acquisition is one of the factors doesn't mean it's the only factor and doesn't mean it doesn't exist in a context with the other factors. So you really have to think about this in a much more multidimensional way. So there are multidimensional um, descriptions, experiences, factors that jointly determine degree of bilingualism. And even though something like age of acquisition is one of those factors, um, you have to be careful that you don't oversimplify, just pull that out and say age of acquisition on its own should have these effects. These are interactive, multidimensional descriptions. Okay, thank you. Um, what follows is actually a comment, right, on the age of acquisition. So may I pass on to the next question then? Thank you for the fabulous talk. What is the optimal way to obtain the bilingual continuum or the aggregate bilingual score? How much weight should we give to each variable contributing to the score, such as the age of acquisition, proficiency, the amount of exposure to each language? Should we treat them equally or should we have more weight in the aggregate bilingual score than the others? Okay, that's a great question and it's a hard question. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give the worst possible answer. Um, uh, the answer is, it depends. So uh, we're engaged now in, in an issue. So I'm in Toronto and we have a ton of data and we can spread it out on a continuum of bilingualism and we find certain things. Toronto is in Canada. If I get in the highway that's not too far from my house and drive for about five hours, I'll be in Montreal. Montreal is also in Canada. It's completely different. And there's a group there working on finding the best multidimensional description of continuous bilingualism that relates to their results. And it's completely different and it's very frustrating. In fact, we did a, a conference presentation, Deb Tatone, who's the head of the Montreal lab, and I did a presentation at a conference and we called it A Tale of Two Cities because everything is different. The way languages are used in the two cities are completely different. The kinds of proficiencies people have are completely different. So I'll be a little more direct and say what we do. And in our case, we have an instrument, it is published, you can download it. And based on our context, our population, we found there were three factors and they had to be weighted exactly as you said. And the weighting of these three, the scores on these three factors is what we use to produce our score. 
In Montreal, the most important factor is how the two languages are used outside the home in social contexts. And I would say for us, the, more important, the most important factor is how the languages are used inside the home. So yes, it's all weighted, but it, uh, it requires context. Hmm? It's a good question. It's, I'm just sorry, I don't have anything more coherent to say. And uh, the next question is about bilingualism versus multilingualism. So I think that has already been answered. And the next question um, and uh, the last we have in the chat is, why should we start with the monolingual brain as the default and conceptualize the bilingual brain as the improved brain and not start with the bilingual brain as the default and the monolingual brain as the reduced brain. Exactly, and there is a small fringe movement uh, calling for recognition of the monolingual disadvantage. Exactly right. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, Professor Bielestok, thank you very much, Ellen, for a wonderful talk and uh, the discussion. So this is the point where we end this part of the meeting. Thank you all uh, who participated. Thank you uh, the attendees uh, who asked the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is it. And our next next speaker in the series will be Judith Kroll in three weeks' time. Thank okay. you. Let me join. Yes, Anna, in and thanking you once again for having accepted our invitation. There are lots of thank yous as you can see in the chat and people clapping. So thank you for this ex most excellent talk. We've been really honored having you here. May I just once again acknowledge the funding of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences and Humanities within the framework of the Research University Excellence Initiative. And uh, I would like to also thank um, uh, Dr. Grzegorz Krynicki for the technical support and uh, for uh, making it all possible. And I can see um, our rector being back with us and he's been waving at us. So thank you very much for your presence as well. May I suggest now that we take a 15 minutes break and what follows is um, a seminar for PhD students and students and there is a separate link that was sent uh, to the participants as well. So thanks once again. Thank you so much for participating and we'll see you uh, uh, during our next lecture in the series. Thank you. Thank you very much.